welcome to my top 10 quarterbacks of the 2024 NFL draft. It's a really interesting group of guys. There's three at the top that everybody knows. There's also three that are not quite in that group, but are very intriguing. And then some decent day two options. And after that, it's very slim pickings. We're going to talk all about my top 10 guys and a couple I haven't gotten to watch yet that could end up sneaking in there by the end of the, the draft cycle. Welcome to the Real Forno Show. Welcome to the Real Forno Show. Hosted by Tyler Fornis, the managing editor of USA Today's Vikings Wire. Writer for the College Football Network. Publisher of Substack Run in Shooter. Host of the good, the bad, and the hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, as well as a founding member of Vikings First and Skull. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Real Forno Show. I'm your host, Tyler Forno. With me, as always, in the top right corner is producer Dave. And Odie is somewhere by my feet chewing on a bone. We are ready to rock and roll we're ready to talk about the quarterbacks in this 2024 NFL draft. We just did a, a, one of our better episodes ever last night, talking about Jaden Daniels, who's projected to go in the top five of this class. We've also done ones on JJ McCarthy, Bo Nix, Spencer Rattler, Michael Pratt, and Michael Penix Jr. And there's more to come, but today we're going to break down my top 10 and kind of where I have all these guys. And we're going to start at the bottom. Cause look, I'm going to make you wait till number one. If you guys know me, <laughs> yeah, you know what? You, you already know number what, who number one is, but if you don't, well, a little bit of a, um, suspense there for you. So let's start at number 10, number 10, Tennessee quarterback, Joe Milton. He got a fifth round grade for me. And I'll be honest. The only reason he got a fifth round grade was because he has probably the strongest arm we'll ever see. Joe Milton can throw the ball 90 yards with and make it just look effortless. He has an absolute rocket of an arm. Problem is he really doesn't play quarterback that well. He doesn't see the field. He doesn't really make progressions and he, he's a fastball only pitcher. You have to be able to throw a change up. You have to be able to take a little bit off of it to layer it over. And you also have to be able to not gun it when the receiver's five yards away. During the senior bowl, there was a clip that was floating around that, and that we're talking the game, not practice here where he's rolling out to his left and there's a receiver wide open in front of him and he misses him by like six yards. Joe Milton is 24 years old. He lost the starting job after winning them. So he won the starting job in Michigan and Tennessee and then promptly lost the starting job within a few weeks. First to Cade McNamara, then to Hendon Hooker. Those aren't exactly juggernauts at the position. So even though Milton has this cannon of an arm, he's just not a very good quarterback. And I honestly think that a position change is probably in his best interest that probably over to tight end. Just, just because at this point, are you really going to be able to develop a guy who is not developing in college? You want to see growth in college. You want to see a guy be able to take prog progressive steps. Milton is not taking progressive steps. And because he's not, why should you expect him to do so at the NFL level? Two prestigious power five institutions benched him after naming him the starter. That should tell you all you need to know about where his progress is. They also, um, for lack of a better term, kind of told him to kick rocks and they wanted to start Nico. Ayamaliava. I think I said that right. Uh, five-star recruit in the 2023 class. And he looks like the real deal. They gave him like a record $8 million NIL deal to come to, to Knoxville. So Joe Milton, number 10, really, he's a driving range guy. He's going to win a bunch of like contests and stuff. You remember those Pro Bowl skills competitions from like 1998, where they would have the long ball competitions and like the strongest guys would get like 73 yards. Joe Milton would hit like 97. And he can, he can probably win a bunch of stuff doing like trick shots. And maybe he could do like a YouTube channel where he could be uncle Rico, but actually able to throw football. 
uh, if you remember that Napoleon Dynamite reference, but I just don't think he's an NFL quarterback. I don't even know if he's a UFL quarterback. And for those of you that don't know, UFL is the merge league with the USFL and the XFL. So Joe Milton, number 10. Now, he sort of sounds like Tavares Jackson when Tavares Jackson came out. Jackson was a cannon of an arm. The dude yeah. could throw the ball 75 yards, nothing like nothing. Mm-hmm. But nobody expected him to play quarterback because he had severe inadequacies at playing. The there spot. was hope. There was hope that you might be able to develop some of that. And taking him at sixty four, I I understood the reason why. I like I, it made sense. He was also younger. Joe Milton's twenty four. Jackson was twenty two, and Jackson played at the FCS level. So you could at least talk yourself into it. Be like, okay, I see the path here. I, you know, if we do this, that, or the other thing, we can get him to a point where he can be a serviceable starter. It didn't work out. And that's the tough part with quarterbacks. A lot of times it doesn't work out, even with the ones that feel like the sure thing. And you probably, I, I'm just, most of the time it doesn't work. Out. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm completely out on Milton. I, I want absolutely nothing to do with him as a quarterback, which is a shame because he has a lot of arm talent. He just hasn't been able to figure out how to use it. And I'm just, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going to be able to help him get there. If anything, let's go to number nine, number nine, Florida state quarterback, Jordan Travis gave him a 73.0 and a fourth round grade. Travis is an interesting player. And when I watch Jordan Travis, the athleticism, the dual threat ability really pops off the screen. And he, he has this tendency to make interesting decisions. He's kind of got a little bit of that gunslinger mentality where he wants to fit in in tight windows. And he has a good enough arm to be able to do so in the intermediate levels of the field. If you want it, ha- want him to throw a far hash deep out, he's not going to be able to do that. He just does not have the requisite arm strength. And I was, I just, I came away a little unimpressed with him compared to what I thought I might considering how good of a season he had. He was the ACC player of the year, but it just wasn't all the way there. Placement, I thought, was just really, really poor. Um, eight, only 18 of 58 passes completed, 31% over 20 yards. And when you watch guys like Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson, bigger guys, jump ball kind of receivers, they could separate a little bit at the college level, but the ball was placed so poorly for them, it's no wonder that they didn't put up a ton of numbers because you'd have Travis trying to throw just a 30 yard like slot fade and that ball would be three, four yards short. And then Coleman and Wilson are having to come back for it. And that was a constant. And to me, that was one of the biggest issues that I ended up seeing. I, I I just don't think he's a, an NFL caliber quarterback, at least as a starter. This is a guy that you would want to have as a backup because I think he's a gamer. I think if you, Hey, everybody's down. This guy could do a Tommy DeVito where he can come in, make a few plays, maybe win a game or two, but you're not going to want to hit your way into him. And another diff- two more difficult parts of the Travis evaluation. He is 24 years old, just like Joe Milton. So where's that? Is that, is he too high in the development curve? Is he just too far along? where you are not going to actually be able to get enough out of him to make him worth the selection. Plus he's dealing with a shattered ankle. Broke it against Northern Alabama in November. And that really crushed Florida state's title hopes. And I, to me, I don't know if I would take the bet on him because of the age, because of what his development curve has been in college. Like it took him three, four years to become a serviceable starter in college. Like it, he was starting games in 2020 and 2021 but it's not like he was so good at the position where it was a guarantee. He was going to be the starter the next year. And then 2022, he started to play better. 2023, he was the ACC player of the year, but he still only threw for like 2000 yards. And when you're, when you play uh, the 10 games that he did, you expect a little bit more than that. I think Travis could end up going undrafted because of the ankle. 
without the, the ankle injury, I would say midday three. I just, I don't really like a lot of these day three guys because I don't see the upside. There's not that, Hey, here's this FCS kid with just his incredible arm, but you got to work on the mechanics. You got to work on this, that, and the other thing. And he likes to throw wide ass open, which is a, a very common scouting term because there's NFL open and there's college open, which is usually wide ass open. And it's usually like, Hey, they're open by like five yards in the NFL. You have a step that's open and it's just a different level. So when you're coming from a lower level, it can take you a little bit of time to kind of figure that out. Josh Allen came from the group of five and it took him time to really figure all that out. So I can see that with one of those guys based on where Travis is at. I wouldn't, I don't think he's the same as Joe Milton, but I wouldn't take a chance on him in the same way as Joe Milton. I just don't think either of them are the juice. Isn't worth the squeeze here, but who knows? Brian Ports asks, where were, say, these last two quarterbacks in relationship to Brian Purdy, or not Brian Purdy, Brock Purdy, and how Brock Purdy was being scouted last year or the year before when he came out? Brock Purdy is so weird when you talk about his college evaluation, his college film. 2019, he looked like he could be like a top 50 pick. And then he absolutely stunk in 2020, 2021, partially because of the scheme that he was in, partially because of the, some of the surrounding talent. Uh, He did have Brees Hall and that makes things easier. Xavier Hutchinson was a good receiver. Charlie Kolar was a good tight end. Both of those guys are in the NFL. They were taken in the fourth round. But when you're playing against so much, some of these like really good and better teams, there wasn't enough talent around him and he had to really run around and try to make plays on his own and play hero ball. And Iowa state is just not a great football program. So his evaluation was really weird. One of his final games, actually his final game was the cheese it bowl against Clemson. He threw a ball. It got batted down. He batted it forward and it was a pick six. It it was just one of the mean plays. And you watch Brock Purdy enough in college. It's like, this guy stinks there's no way he can be good. And you know what? He kind of proved us wrong. He's become a good quarterback in the NFL, a good starter. I'd put him uh, on like, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, as far as best quarterbacks in the NFL. If you would have told me he was a good backup, I wouldn't have believed you. I thought he was that poor of a prospect. That's also the tough part about evaluating quarterbacks. You're wrong a lot. Mm-hmm. And you can right. only go by you, what you see on film and then back it up with the data and then make the best evaluation you can. And then when you miss, learn from every miss and try to use that data moving forward. I remember when uh, the Bills quarterback came out and we were all saying he couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. He had an arm. We knew he could throw a mile, mm-hmm. but he couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. And what happens? He turns into a very good quarterback, but that's... That's rare. The the difference with Josh Allen was one, his surroundings were even worse than Brock Purdy's, but he would flash the ability to just make not, not just the long throw, but just these asinine highlight reel NFL street kind of throws. You remember the game NFL street where he, like you could just do these trick passes and you throw it behind the back and uh, like jump off the wall and that kind of stuff. Josh Allen would do these things where he would roll out to his left and he would jump and he almost looked like a Superman pose and throw it perfectly in the corner of the end zone, like 30, 40 yards down the field. So he flashed the ability to do the normal stuff, but he had no mechanical base. He had no sense of what to do with his feet. And the idea was, okay, if you give this guy a couple of years and let him work through some of this stuff, you can get a great NFL quarterback but a lot of guys can't ever figure out the mechanics and they can't ever figure out how to utilize your base properly, how to operate as an efficient level quarterback, instead of just being somebody who's trying to be explosive and Allen figured it out. And he is the poster child for you have a lot of talent and have no idea what to do with it. So if you, like I wrote about it with Malik Willis, like if you want to take Malik Willis, you use the Josh Allen development plan. You give him the time to figure out how to play quarterback and you figure out 
like how those little details, they matter and how you can help him develop. I thought you could turn Malik Willis into a really good quarterback by treating him like the bills treated Josh Allen. He never got that chance. So we'll never really know if he was ever going to be able to really become anything. He probably never will, or he probably wouldn't have, but Tennessee hated him. <laughs> like John Robinson got fired because he drafted Malik Willis and Vrabel didn't want him. Like that was a, a big part of it. So when you look at all these details, like it's so hard to develop the position and it's so hard to be right all the time, but you always take from history. You always look at, okay, this is why it worked for him. And this is why it could work for this guy. But Hey, this guy's a completely different type of raw. So you can't necessarily compare the two. So that's like kind of where the Brock Purdy evaluation comes in for me. I still stand by the evaluation in the fact that at the time he looked like a, an XFL quarterback at best, but he's proven us wrong. And I think you have to draw a lot more from that 2019 season to really understand what he could have been in, in 2023, because that's the year that would have shown all the things that we're seeing now. So it's a very complicated process. And Purdy is the poster child for complicated process. So, well, and I still think besides that, a lot of it has to do with who's the head coach, right? How are they going to treat that quarterback? Are they a quarterback friendly one that likes to develop them? And mm -hmm. how are somebody going to sit and watch for a while? Are they going to, how they're going to groom them? Or are they going to throw them straight away in? And yeah. what are the weapons the dude is surrounded by? The situation. Mm -hmm. If he's got great weapons and a good offensive line, that makes up for a lot of the rookie stuff that happens. Mark Bulger, when he took over for the Rams, was outstanding. He made the Pro Bowl. Mm -hmm. The dude could play football. But because the Rams post-Super Bowl had let the team go, lost all their offensive line, he just got obliterated time and time and time again and he got shell shocked and then he was out in the league out of the league within a few years from pro mm -hmm. bowl to out of the league because yeah. he didn't have everything else to support him beyond that and that was that was it and it was a shame i thought it was a shame but mm -hmm. same yeah it's for rookies you surround them with a good foundation they have more of a chance of developing into something than if you just throw them on a crap team Mm -hmm. Carolina Panthers <clears throat> and uh, go you're it tag yeah go win us football games mm -hmm. yeah it's quarterback is just weird and uh, Odie is so sick of talking about quarterbacks he's whining at the door right now but he's just <laughs> he's gonna have to deal we're talking quarterbacks today baby number eight on the list everybody's favorite Oregon quarterback, Bo Nix. And if you've been here before, you know how I feel about Bo Nix. You know, I don't think he's an NFL caliber quarterback. And I, I've explained why the box score stats look good, but it's the context of why the box score stats look good. And some of the deeper metrics, I, I think it's, it's a mirage how, how positive some of them are because it's a smoke and mirrors offense. When he played at Auburn and you have to take the Auburn tape into a, uh, account why because the Oregon offense completely took away everything that Auburn did and created an offense that was basically the anti Auburn offense to maximize whatever good Bo Nix had as a quarterback and because of that you got the success that they had the last two years and he should be applauded for it he played well but we're not talking about college good we're talking about playing well in the National Football League and he does not process a b c d well at all and he still has this tendency to bozo bail the pocket where he's like running around like Christian Ponder you remember some of those scrambles where it just looks really really rough Bo Nix is still doing that on occasion it, he's 23 years old but it's it's different so when Jared Hall came out he had less than 30 starts and we talked about the Mormon mission and all that it was a different type of old Bo Nix is the most starts in the history of college football 61 starts. That's a lot. 
How am I going to expect a guy who still can't do full field progressions, who still struggles to read and see the field and has an offense that basically gives him wide ass open throws to be able to run an NFL offense? I, I don't see it. I haven't seen it for a long time. And yeah, he threw 30% of his balls behind the line of scrimmage. 30%. That's insane. And then 56% of them were within 10 yards. Like the one spot where you have to be really good in the NFL. Sorry. I think it was like 64%, not 56. He threw a lot within that um, behind the line of scrimmage to 10 yard range. You have to dominate 10 to 20 yards. That's the window. You have to be great because that's how you can get the ball quick enough to be able to move with chunk plays but you're also not putting everything in a lot of danger like you would with a lot of deep shots. 10 to 20 yards is where you have to win and where you have to dominate. I don't trust Bonix to do that. I don't believe he's capable of doing that. And you know what? If I'm wrong, we're going to have to go to the drawing board and try and figure out where I was wrong. I don't think I am. I'm confident in this one more than I am in almost the, all the rest of my evaluations. It's a smoke and mirrors quarterback. And what you see is a mirage and not what you're going to get in the National Football League. So Bo Nix is number eight for me. Fourth round, great. Yeah, I'm out. But let's move on to number seven. Number seven is a guy with a hell of a lot of talent. A lot of questions. Spencer Rattler of South Carolina. You go back to 2020. Spencer Rattler looked like he was going to be the first overall pick in 2022. That year, he was phenomenal at Oklahoma. First year as a starter, he was throwing it down the field with success, accuracy, velocity, mobility. He had everything. Then he took a massive, massive step back the next year. And I don't know what happened. I don't know why he took that massive step back, but he did. And then he kind of got ran out of Oklahoma. The fan base turned on him. Uh, The coaching staff benched him for Caleb Williams. Well, then the coaching staff and Caleb Williams left. So he followed his old offensive coordinator, the one who recruited him to South Carolina in Shane Beamer. And that South Carolina offense was starting me, Dave and Mary. It was starting (laughs) a bunch of people who should not be playing offensive line at the college level. And you could see, you could see the struggles. You could see how, he just couldn't process anything because he was getting rushed so quickly, so consistently. And he was having to bail the pocket. And you know what? He made it work well enough, but you just knew that there was so much more that he could offer, but you couldn't see it because the surroundings were so bad. Now he has his moments. He makes some poor decisions every now and then he puts the ball in harm's way more often than you'd like. But how much of that is he's just trying to make a play because he knows what what the situation is, what <clears throat> what's going on with everybody in front of him. And he just knows if I don't make a play, we're not going to win this football game. So you have to contextualize some of that. So I don't view his big time throw to turnover worthy play rate as poorly as other people do, but it's also not good. And a lot of people want to see him in mobile because it's a more structured environment, a more, hey, you're not going to play with just a trash heap at offensive line. You're going to play with guys who are going to play at the next level. And you know what? He played pretty well. I thought he was the most consistent quarterback all week. He only played one series in the actual game. Well, that series, he went four for four, 64 yards on a touchdown, one MVP. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more. And the one thing with Rattler that we really haven't talked about, he's got a phenomenal arm. Like, uh, it, I'm not going to compare it to Mahomes, but he does similar things. So it, it's just an easy way to describe some of the things he does. All right. So he can launch the ball at multiple arm angles. He can throw across his body. He can throw on the move and he can throw deep with power and accuracy and also distance. He can do all of those same things. He's not Patrick Mahomes. Let's not get it twisted. But if you want to s- kind of understand some of the things that he does, it's a good baseline because you can see some of the things Mahomes does and be like, rather can do some of those too. And I don't know if he's going to be really good at the next level. He's going to be 23 years old, but 
he's got just insane arm talent. And if you give him in a, in a good nurturing spot, I think he could at least be a Jameis Will, uh, Winston type backup where he can come in and sling the ball everywhere and make plays for you and win you a few games if you need it. He also has the arm talent to be a top end starter, but it's the rest of his game that needs work and needs to be figured out and parsed out and developed. Will that ever happen? I don't know. But if you're going to take a shot on a guy in late day two, this is the guy I'm taking a shot on because you have all those positive traits and you have some context of why things went poorly for him. And by being able to answer some of those questions, you can have a better semblance of what to do and how to nurture him moving forward. So I really like the idea of what Spencer Rattler can be. I have no idea if he'll be that. We'll find out. But... He's got the arm talent to do so. All right. <sighs> Number six, two lane quarterback, Michael Pratt. Pratt gives me very big Teddy Bridgewater vibes in his arm. Accurate can layer the ball nicely. No juice. He has like no arm strength. And I'll tell you, if he had, Kirk Cousins type arm strength where I don't think Cousins has a great arm. I think he has a good to very good arm. And if, if he's just an average to above average arm, I think Pratt's a first round guy and I don't think it's close. I have heard some medical issues with him. I haven't been able to confirm any of that. But when you talk about Pratt, you talk about a gamer, talk about a guy who is a true dual threat. He likes to run a little too much for his skill level at it. It's kind of, not the best runner, but he can eat up chunks of yards and he can make good decisions. He can process the field. Well, he just doesn't have the arm strength, the true arm talent to really be an elevator at the next level, but he has a lot of everything else. And that's why he got a second round. grade. If he had an, a good arm, good arm strength first round, but he doesn't. And that's, what's going to limit him at the next level. I don't know if he's ever going to be a high end starter, but yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at with uh, Michael Pratt at number six. I need I need some water. We've been doing a lot of talking here. <laughs> well, that's why I was have my bourbon or something else to drink sitting there <laughs> with it. Now, I, Delton, you say he has Pratt above Rattler. Oh no, Houston, we have a problem. There's, it's all opinion. Every single eval, whether you're watching Tyler, who I think does a great job, whether you're watching Drew on uh, Vikings Report with Ted and Drew, whether you're watching PFF or whether you're watching anybody else in the sphere, it's their eyeballs evaluating the players and their opinion on what they see. And we're all different. I disagree with Tyler on occasion, and it it just happens to be, but that's – Tyler puts in hours worth of work and, to learn about these guys, not only just watching tape, but learn more about them, what they've done previous, et cetera, see if they've grown sort of the mentality, and he puts it all together to come up with his best opinion on it. But again, it's – everybody's different. And we're getting to players where it is different. And it's different all the way to the top on this mm -hmm. list. So you'll find some sites that love player A. Other sites say player A is garbage, and you've got to go with player C. And they all differ. Mm -hmm. you're, you're getting somebody else's opinion. And take it for what it's worth. Value it. Bounce it against yours, what you've seen. You can agree or disagree. It's... It is what it is. And we won't find out until the kid's in the NFL and he's played a few years. Mm -hmm. Does he turn out to be somebody? Well, first off, Dave, I want to say, I want to say one thing. I, I got to get this off my trash, uh, my chest. <laughs> Drew stinks. I'm kidding. I love Drew, but uh, I, I had to throw a little shade at him, especially because uh, his, his golden boy quarterback might end up with the Minnesota Vikings. Um, for those of you that don't know, Drew's a big Michigan fan. 
And I, I love that I'm going to be able to rub it into Ted because I told Ted, like, I think CJ Shroud's the guy. He's like, no, I don't think he is. And I, uh, I, that that's going to be a big win for me. I can't wait. But <laughs> let's, uh, before we move on to number five, I think we, we, have to, we have to take a moment to talk about our friends at Underdog Rescue Minnesota, where they save animals' lives. And they save them from all over. They save them from shelters that, that are overcrowded, which is a, unfortunately a really big thing down in the south. Um, they save them from the streets. They save them from private surrenders. They take breeder releases, which are... We had a breeder release in Eni Claire, and it's just so sad to see how ravaged some of their bodies are by having... I don't even know how many litters Eclair had, but it, it must have been like eight or nine just the way they treat these they dogs and under, twice a year underdog takes them in, takes care of them, gets all their medicals ready to go. And then you take them home and they get to live the good life. Finally. So underdog rescue If you need a dog, they have all kinds of breeds available. And for lack of a better term, the inventory is ever changing and they have all kinds of breeds coming in too. So you never know when you're going to find your best friend or you could foster. And when that breed comes in, you would be able to foster that dog and then get priority. I believe priority for adoption as well. Underdogrescuemn.com. Save the dogs. Now, let's talk about my quarterback number five. Michael Penix Jr. Michael Penix Jr. out of Washington really throws a javelin ball down the field. And he's a very talented player, but there are some real question marks surrounding Michael Penix Jr. But let's talk about the positives first. So Penix, great anticipator, great deep ball thrower, doesn't really attack the middle of the field, but I think that's more of a complex of what Ryan Grubb, the offensive coordinator, who's now going to Seattle, wanted to do on offense. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how he kind of translates to the NFL because of that. Russell Wilson hates throwing over the middle of the field and he's been out of college over a decade. So some guys never really get to that point where you can feel comfortable throwing over the middle of the field. The middle of the field is like a cheat code. If you can dominate the middle of the field, you can win a lot more football games because it's so much easier to throw over the middle of the field. Like as far as like distance than it is to throw outside the numbers because it takes less time to get there. You're throwing, hey, A to B. If I'm th- making a 10-yard throw straight ahead, it's 10 yards. If I'm making a 10-yard throw to the, from the far hash, it's like 35-40. So all those things matter, and those things add up and make a difference. Think of it like a triangle, like where, ah, I can't remember, but you have your right angle and then the tangent right here. That's, That's the long one. Well, no, that's the triangle. I, I'm trying to think of what just that that one side is called. There's a name for it. I just don't remember. It's been a long time since I was in, in math league back in high school. So, all right. But Penix doesn't really like to attack over the middle of the field. So that's going to be interesting how that's going to translate. But he's so, so, so good being able to attack down the field and trusting his receivers. He has a great rapport with his receivers, which is going to be awesome for the Minnesota Vikings if, theoretically, he ended up with Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison. Because what he had with Romo Dunze, you should be able to develop that kind of chemistry with either Addison or Jefferson, if not both. They connected on 17 of 24 contested catches. Why? Odunze is so good, and Penix placed the ball very, very well. It's about maximizing your output. And Penix did a fantastic job of doing just that. And I am a really big fan of what he was able to do in college. Hypotenuse. Thank you, G Mac. Ah, I, I was, you no, know, Jordan said that too. Thank you. I was trying to figure that out. Um, hey, so, you haven't used it in a while. So it sort of flips nope. off into the background. No, that it does. So, my big thing with Penix is you have to figure out what the medicals are and you have to figure out why his mechanics are as poor as they are. He is going to be 24. Like we're going to deal with older prospects for a while. Why NIL and COVID it's just going to be that way for a little bit. 
And <clears throat> until NIL balances out, you're going to see older prospects. Next year, going to see a lot more older prospects. It's just going to be a fact of life. So when you... <clears throat> I keep getting these is gunk stuck in my throat. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to blame you, Dave. It's your fault. It okay. is your fault. Usually <laughs> is. Usually so is. Penix has had two season ending tour and ACLs. He's had two ma- major shoulder injuries. One being a severe dislocation that ended the season and one being an AC joint. So wh- what's his health? Uh, I have seen the report that Dr. Nee Elitrach, who did perform um, the, I believe he was the one who performed the, both the ACL of TJ Hawkinson and the Achilles of Kirk Cousins. I think he performed both of those procedures. He signed off on Penix's knee. That doesn't mean NFL teams will. And it's not just about, hey, what does it look like right now? What is it going to look like in 10 years? What is it going to look like in five years? And are his some of his mechanical issues due to some of those injuries that he's had? And here's what I mean. He has really wonky feet. He sets his base way too wide and he has a re- sidearm release. And, w- and we talked about it with Jaden Daniels. When you have a sidearm release, you can sail the football. If you don't have proper footwork, it's a lot easier to sail the football with a, with a sidearm release than it is with a three quarter over the top. It doesn't mean that you have to change it, but you just have to be aware of what the issues are and you have to be able to try and curb some of those issues. And uh, Delton, he left, uh, it was Indiana. And one of the reasons he left Indiana was there was an opening in Washington and Kalen DeBoer was his offensive coordinator in, I think it was 2019 at Indiana. Then he took the Fresno state job in 2020 And then he took the Washington job in 2022. So he followed DeBoer to Washington. It was going to be Jake Hayner, but Hayner didn't quite have enough credits to graduate. And he was already a transferred from Washington once. So they ended up with Michael Penix and it worked out for everybody. Hayner was a mid round pick still played well at Fresno state and Michael Penix jr. Nearly won two Heisman trophies while quarterbacking the Huskies but you have to figure out why. And you have to figure out if you can fix some of those mechanical stuff because uh, as somebody put in the chat, Bucky Brooks said, you need a fortress in front of him. He, he, you think he's mobile. You've seen highlights of him running around. There's the one uh, where Indiana upset Penn state in the COVID year where he, he did that Michael Vick dive to get a two point conversion. Yeah. He can do that every once in a while. That's not his game. And that's not how he's going to win with any form of consistency in the national football league. So, you're going to you're going to have to treat him like a, a true pocket passer. You're going to have to have really good guys in front of him and you're going to have to be you know ready for those kind of things. And you know what? That's a problem for some people. And I don't blame them because you want to be able to have a guy who's at least a little mobile. Kirk Cousins is a little mobile. He's a pocket passer, but he can do a little bit with the mobility thing. Will he be able to after the Achilles? Who knows? We'll find out. But before that, yeah, you could do bootlegs. He could escape the pocket on occasion. Will Penix be able to do any of that? Will he feel comfortable doing any of that? The answer is the fir- to the first part is probably no. Comfortable? Well, if he's not doing it now, I don't see why he would really do it in the NFL. So that's something you have to be aware of too. I gave him a second round grade. I could see him potentially sneaking into the first round. Some team wants to get a fifth year option or make sure they get his services intact. Because, hey, he may go at the beginning of the second. And I, I could see that happening. But, yeah, Penix, second-round guy. I I just have too many questions. And I'll tell you what. If the medicals come back poorly, he could go to undraft. He could have an undraftable grade. Because, like, remember Carson Strong? I was really high on Carson Strong. I had him as quarterback, too. I thought you could potentially take him in round one or beginning of round two based on the talent based on how you could project out that talent. The big question was the knees. And we got a lot of mixed reporting on the knees. Some people said that the knees were awful. Some people said that the the knees were just fine. And he'd be able to be just fine in the NFL. Well, he retired a couple weeks ago. So 
I'm going to be very curious to see what happens with Penix, and we're going to know a lot more at the Combine because we didn't really learn anything about his health at, at the Senior Bowl. A Combine, everybody gets a medical check. We'll find out. Yes, by team and NFL doctors. Yep. All right. Let's talk about number four. He's been the most popular quarterback among Vikings fans over the past week. J.J. McCarthy of Michigan. Who? Look, J.J. McCarthy of Michigan. And I don't think it's a hot take that people are now talking about him going in the top 10. I don't think it's unreasonable to have him higher because he's just this weird combo. And I'm going to steal this. Uh, I've saw, I've seen a few people say it already. High floor, high ceiling type player where he already does so many of like the, Hey, you can trust him to just operate in an NFL offense. You can trust him to make quality decisions. And he's got the mobility aspect. So you can gain yards on the ground cheaply, but he's also got this arm and really good arm talent where you could develop him into a top flight quarterback in the NFL. So he's got this weird combination of high floor, high ceiling. Don't see that very often. And I still think McCarthy has some uh, questions to answer. I do think he's really good in the intermediate level of the field, like 10 to 30 yards. I think he can hit a seam with precision better than most quarterbacks. Gave me some Dak Prescott vibes where he was just able to fire it in there with those deep seam routes, the tight ends. And look, McCarthy's a really, really talented football player. It's not his fault that things went the way they did this past year at Michigan or the year before Jim Harbaugh likes to play a certain way. He wants to run the ball, drive it down your throat and play great defense. The quarterback is a piece to the puzzle. He is not the answer, but when McCarthy needed to, he needed to make a play. He needed to drive down the field. He answered those questions. And he's one of the best third down and long quarterbacks in this draft. His average depth of target, I believe, is 13.8. He was com- uh, completing passes at an incredibly high clip in that range. Uh, I really, really like McCarthy. I think he could be a great quarterback. But the questions I have about McCarthy keep me from really being able to label him with that first round grade. Because there is a scenario where he absolutely stinks up the joint. And that's why I have him where I do. If you believe in him, and this is where like grades can get really finicky with quarterbacks. Okay. If you give him a second round grade and you are still pounding the table for him, you know what? I don't care. I understand the flaws. I believe the positives are going to outweigh it. And we're going to be able to figure this out with him. I want him at 11. Take him. Take him. That's okay. Take him. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's you don't do that with other positions. You do it with quarterback because it's the most important. And you know what? If you're right, nobody's going to care where you took him. Nobody's going to care that you took him too high on draft day compared to the consensus board. Nobody's going to care that you gave up a ton of capital to go get him. Nobody's going to care because you got it right. If you get it wrong, you're fired. That's how the NFL works. If you get quarterback wrong and you're not Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch, where you're still going to Super Bowls with the guy you took last in the NFL draft, you can get away with the Trey Lance thing. Now, will they be able to keep up what they have right now because of the salary cap and because of the lack of uh, high-end talent that they were able to draft? That's a whole different question. But McCarthy, very, very good player. And I have him at fourth. And I'm okay with having him in fourth. People are going to have him higher and I don't blame him. But I also think really highly of the three guys ahead of him. And we're going to have that conversation. Dave, what did you think of McCarthy? Uh, From what I've heard, the little bit I've seen and the love that a few people give him, Thor being one of them, obviously um, his coach being another, I think... From what I'm hearing, he could develop into a very, very good pro quarterback that would make somebody like Kevin O'Connell 
very happy to have on his team. So if he's there at 11 and we don't have to trade up and we get him straight at 11, I'm fine with that pick. I'd live with it. It's the right move. Now, if one of the top three are there at 11, then we're going to get a little bit of discussion. But if he's there at 11, top three are gone. I have no issue. It's the right move. It may be the wrong guy in the long run, but it's the right move. And GMs will get hammered for doing the right move, and then the guy doesn't turn pan out. Well, the GM may say, hey, he looked great to me at the time. Everything worked. Something else went wrong. And you can say, all right, give you another chance to do this because there is risk involved when you pick any quarterback. But, i.e., you know, Mahomes didn't go first overall in the draft. You've got to be able to do that. But if he fell to us at 11 and the top three were gone, I'd have no no qualms selecting him at number 11. None. I'd be happy with that. I would be too. Uh, I would not be happy if they took him over one of my top three. But it has nothing to do with the fact that I don't think he's good. I th- I like the, the other three guys better. And to me, that's, that's kind of what I'm looking at. So let's talk about my top three. Number three is, <clears throat> look, it's going to turn some heads, and I don't care. It's Caleb Williams, uh, USC quarterback. And I want to preface it this way. Williams was built out to be this mythological being throughout the last couple of years. When it turns out, he's just a really, really, really good quarterback prospect. He's not God. And I think being built up like that was unfair and it set him up to fail. And I really liked his tape. I liked it more than I thought I was going to because live viewing, Dave, it looked like he played a lot of hero ball. It looked like he was just trying to make things happen when he didn't need to. He still has an issue taking a layup. So there are some basketball players that won't take the layup. They just want the three pointer and there's method to the madness. But if you have a clear path to the basket for the easy play, just go take the easy play. There's nothing wrong with taking 10, 15 yards and going to first down. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't need to always go for the home run. You don't need to always go for the deep ball touchdown. And Williams is going to have to learn that. He's also going to have to learn to be more consistent with his mechanics. I think he does not have his upper half and lower half synced up nearly enough. And you can see inaccuracies with his throwing, especially down the field, because he just, he has a cheat code arm. Aaron Rodgers, if you ever watch him play, has god-awful mechanics. But he's Aaron Rodgers. He has an just incredible arm talent where he can just, he can be stand flat-footed, fall backwards, and throw it on a dime 30 yards down the field. He just has that ability. And when guys have that ability, sometimes the mechanics just aren't there. They're never really able to figure that out. And... I want Williams to sit. I want him to sit for eight weeks to a full year because I want him to get that down. And this is where the Mahomes comparison, I think does work. Look, he's not Patrick Mahomes, but you know what? Mahomes was gifted a year to sit and learn with Andy Reid and Alex Smith, how to play quarterback at the next level and not be a playmaker. Caleb Williams needs that. He's not going to be afforded it, but he needs it. And it's going to help him. And it could help him become a great NFL quarterback. But because he's not going to have that, I, I'm going to be a little bit worried about him being able to really take that next step. Like, especially going to Chicago. I don't trust Chicago to develop a quarterback. I thought they ruined Justin Fields. <laughs> and I want to see Caleb Williams succeed. I want to see him thrive. I want to see him be nurtured and really taken care of it from a coaching standpoint. I want to see all those things. I haven't in Chicago. And that worries me with his, if him coming to the next level, how are they going to be able to change things? We'll find out. That's that probably Chicago what's going to happen. Up. They have the, tra- the tradition of ruining quarterbacks. That's just mm-hmm. who they are. And he, 
Delton says says too emotional. He does play a very emotional style of football. Oh, I don't care about that. Doesn't bother me at all. You know what? You know who else plays an emotional style? Travis Kelsey. Right. But what I'm saying is if you're emotional, very emotional, that's another way to get in inside somebody's head. And if you're screwing it up, you have the people in the press and the fans and the coaches. If they're all messed up in Chicago, he could easily be screwed up real fast. So I'll say this. I, I want to amend my statement. He doesn't play emotional. He's ju- He just is an emotional person off the field because like uh, everybody's going to talk about him being nonchalant in press conferences and the, the painted nails, which he does because his mom owns a nail salon. It's like it, his way of showing her love. Like it's 2024. Who cares? Like who, who gives a shit? And everybody's going to point to after the Washington game where he, he carried that team. And it was almost like he felt emotionally just like everything hit him. And he saw his mom in the crowd. He goes up to her, gives her a hug and he just, it just all came out. The, here's the thing. I can't give you this with certainty, but I bet you there's a good amount of NFL players who do that. You just don't see it. And there's a lot and you give everything you can to this game and you try so hard to get that win, to win a national championship, to win a conference championship, to beat a great team who ended up being the national runner up. You give everything you have and then you don't get anything back and it can just it can break you and it can cause you to just let out a lot of emotion and look we're vikings fans we should be able to understand and empathize with that look at how we've been built up 98 09 2000 2017 the amount we've been built up and we feel like we're there, we're going to get to the Super Bowl, and then we get let down, and then we release those emotions. It's the same concept, except they're playing the game. So I, to me, I, I don't care. Everything that I know from the people I've talked to believe that this guy has the right head on his shoulders. He absolutely loves the game of football, and he's going to do everything he can to help your team win. To me, I'm in. That's fine. I, I can, it, you know what? If he cries at a press conference, I don't care. If he wants to paint his nails, support his mom, I don't care. Got everything else. I'm sold. So that's Caleb Williams, uh, quarterback three. You're going to see him as a lot of people's quarterback ones. And some people are very interesting uh, when they talk about it. They're like, oh, he should only be quarterback one. There's no way he shouldn't be anything else. Well, there are issues to his game and he's not a perfect prospect. The best prospect I've ever scouted in my time doing this was Trevor Lawrence. I gave him a 96 out of 100. Caleb Williams, 87 point, point six. And you know what? I screwed up. Caleb Williams is actually my number two. I jumped the gun. So Caleb Williams is my number two. <laughs> and you know what? He's a good number two. But you know what? One point one points behind him was my quarterback three. My quarterback three is Jaden Daniels. And I debated who I was going to have above who at this spot. And that's why my brain cannon decided that I was going to say the wrong thing. Caleb Williams, number two, Jaden Daniels is number three. Let's talk about Jaden. Really good football player. He is a true dual threat. And we talked extensively about him last night. True dual threat can attack you vertically with the football in his hands and throwing it. He is a good anticipator. I wish he wouldn't bail the pocket so early as much, but he's he's showing improvement. Uh, I've talked to people where they're like, I don't think he, that's an issue for him at all. Like, well, I think it's improving and he's getting better at it, but I still does it a little too much for my liking where he bails to really try to run the football instead of sticking in the pocket or he could stick in there for like an extra second. It's a nitpick for me, but I think he could be better at it. And that's why I have it as a negative but he loves the slot fade. He was lethal with it. He would it. And he had great receivers to throw to Brian Thomas jr. And Malik neighbors are probably both first round picks this year. Kyron Lacey could be a first round pick next year. Like he was thrown to some real dudes. Mason Taylor tight end was really good as well. Like all of this. You have to contextualize it with 
the evaluation. I thought he was just a really good football player, no matter who he was playing with. And it was really impressive to see the growth and like the difference between him and Bo Nix. So they both spent three years at another school, Bo Nix at Auburn, Jane Daniels at Arizona state. And Daniels was not a good passer. He, he showed some flashes, but he never really grew to develop any form of consistency. It was things were bad at Arizona state for a lot of reasons. When he entered the transfer portal, his teammates publicly cleaned out his locker and like it was on like media cameras and everything. It was a bad scene. Well, he goes to LSU and they help him turn into a legit passer, a NFL caliber passer. I love seeing that kind of development and growth. And sometimes situation matters for that. Bo Nix contextualized his growth. They took away a lot of the hard stuff. LSU didn't take away the hard stuff. Daniels just figured it out. And there's reports of him using like NASA technology to really grow and develop with this processing. And he's done so many things to improve and get better. I love Jaden Daniels. He's right now my quarterback three. And he's one of the few people I've ever given bonus points to. Because my quarterback scale does not account, Dave, for being a great runner. Because you don't need to be to be a great quarterback. But if you have it, it's a cheat code. It adds to the evaluation. So you deserve credit for it. And I, I will only award up to five points. GMAC, yes. Um, we talked about that last night. I comped him to Gumby back in December. Uh, I still think that holds true. He's Gumby. Um, I also well, would accept. That was brought character. up yesterday. You talked about it a little bit different in Gumby. And you said that's the perfect. Now, no, because remember, I pulled it up on my phone. I tweeted yep. it in, in December. Yep. Now, for those that are watching on, from Facebook and those that are joined us tonight so far, and there's over 100 viewing, and we appreciate it, you know, do all the things to help the algorithm. We'd appreciate that too. Like, when, comment, subscribe, ring the bell so you know when we're going live. Yeah. Tyler's talking about last night when he does the skull searches. That's on YouTube only. That's the only place you can find it on the next morning on your podcast feed. But the video is on YouTube only. And if you're just used to Facebook, you're going to miss it. So you need to go to Vikings First and Skull on YouTube. And you can watch all the skull searches we've done to date. It was just happened that yesterday was Mr. Jaden Daniels. Yeah. It was, and it was a really good one. It was a lot of fun discussion. And now we have to talk about quarterback one, Dave. Mm -hmm. Drum roll, please. UNC's Drake May. I love Drake May. Um, Drake May is one of the better quarterbacks I've scouted in a long time. Um, Justin Herbert vibes with Drake May. And I'm not going to be the only one who says Justin Herbert when talking about Drake May. So... That's going to be, it's going to be something you hear a lot. Why is it going to be something you hear a lot? Well, look at the body. Looks like Justin Herbert, right? When you watch him play, gives you vibes of Justin Herbert with the way he can javelin a football down the field with the way he can attack vertically. And he's just that good. Um, there have been some, some metrics that have come out uh, and may, kind of talked about publicly the last couple days where may isn't necessarily the best in the red zone where he is, he doesn't have great accuracy under pressure. He could be better under pressure. Part of that. I'm going to contextualize a little bit where I'm not as worried about it. I admit it. it they're issues. And in my evaluation, I have them as issues. I have it as ish, an issue where he has a tendency to bail the pocket truly really because his internal clock is off. And he likes to default to bailing the pocket instead of climbing it. Part of that is going to be the offense that he's in. He's in a really, really bad offense that does not translate to the NFL. The NFL runs air raid concepts, but they don't run the air raid. And the only team that's run the air raid is the Arizona Cardinals. And that hasn't worked out. It did not work out. Cliff Kingsbury got canned. But you can run air raid concepts in the NFL, but when you run them full-time in college, it can really mess with things because everything's so rhythmic and everything is, Hey, three-step drop fire. And you're doing all these things, but if it's not there, you don't do a ton of 
full field progressions. You do a lot of half field stuff. You look at the state, the coverage, and you decide, hey, am I going to go left side or right side? And then when you decide that, then you build off of that and you do your half field read. So you are reading the full field before the snap, but you're not doing it after. And with May, I think when he doesn't see those that first read there, he has a tendency sometimes to really bail the pocket. He has flashed the ability to do full field reads, so I'm not really super concerned. But I want to see him get more comfortable in the pocket. And I think part of the reason he wasn't comfortable is his O-line stinks. And that's a that's a big issue with a lot of college teams, and especially when you have to contextualize college quarterbacks. Not every team is going to have a good offensive line. It's hard to find good offensive linemen in the NFL, let alone in college. So those things matter. And one uh, before we get to the good, let's let's continue talking about some of the things I'm concerned with. Um, mechanics are great in the quick game, uh, but processing overall slows him down a little bit. Uh, he doesn't. Like when he sees it, his legs aren't set and ready. So one thing I loved about like watching Peyton Manning play football is it would almost look like he's doing like, you know, Dave, when you're doing up downs and your feet are constantly moving. And then when the whistle blows, you drop paint. That was Peyton Manning's legs all the time. They would be constantly moving because when he saw something, he would be ready to just set and fire. May doesn't have that lower half and upper half synced enough to where he's a, when he sees it, he's able to always take advantage and fire it. And that's where I think some of the inaccuracies come from. That's where he can really take a big step and improve a full off season, working on that footwork and fixing it could eliminate the issue. It doesn't mean it will, but it could because it's, it's something that's real. Oh, well, well got, simple. your internet's, Keep freezing. Uh, hopefully, he does work on a no, off season. And speaking of up downs, I've done them by the thousands. Anyways, both football and in the military. Yes, and just win one. I've done a ton of flutter kicks too. Well, yes, yes, yes. And here right. he comes. There we go. Perfect. So as I was talking about with some of the, some of the mechanical stuff, if you do a full year and you really work on like the full off season of fixing that footwork, theoretically it should work, but footwork's difficult to fix because you're doing it consistently. It's like, I always bring up when you want to fix something mechanically, I bring up Tim Tebow because when he came out in the NFL draft, you had he had just a elongated arm motion. It can take you like 10,000 reps to fix something with muscle memory. So with the drop back, it can take a long time to fix and you may never fully get it. But if you can fix that, that's going to fix a lot with May because he's got the natural gifts. He's got the natural arm talent. He can see the field relatively well, but sometimes his, his vision is not up to date with his feet. And that can really, really be a problem. Let's talk about a few positives before we get out of here, because this has been a long episode, but there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. So that's okay. Uh, look, the footwork in quick game is great. He knows how to, it's when he has to hitch and then keep looking and then hitch again. That's when his footwork gets sloppy. But one, two, three, fire that quick game stuff, throw a slant, throw a speed out, throw a screen. He does that really, really well. And when he gets to the NFL, he's going to run quick game at such a high level that it's going to make things really easy for him to succeed early while you build the rest of it out. And by doing stuff early and building the rest of it out is going to help you long-term be great. And I love what May is able to do. And the last thing I'm going to say, he has an over three to one big time throw to turnover worthy play rate, 80 to 26. This past year, he only had 10 turnover worthy plays. This dude wants to attack down the field. He wants to crush you, but he understands that you can't always do that. I want him on my football team. People can overlook him. They can only look at the raw numbers, be like, well, this, that, or the other thing. That's fine. You can do that. I disagree completely. I think Drake may is the best quarterback in this class. And I think he has the ability to be a 
transcendent player for a franchise. If the Vikings got him, I would be over the moon. <laughs> let him fall. Let him fall and let the Vikings trade up for him. I dare you, NFL. I well, dare you. Speaking of trading up, and I'm going to show all of them listed. Do you think the Vikings will trade up? And if they do trade up, do you think it's to the number three spot with New England? And how much would it cost? And the viewers are getting to see the entire list, your top 10 right now. Uh, Dave, I really don't know. I don't know who's going to actually be willing to trade down. You can make an argument that both Washington and New England should trade down because you want to give a whoever's going to play quarterback for that team the right tools to succeed and maybe punting a year and really building up the infrastructure with like a great offensive lineman or a great wide receiver and not take the quarterback. But you should probably just take the quarterback. So we'll find out how these regimes want to handle it because it is a new regime in both Washington and new England. So we really don't know what they want to do. We, it's going to be a big mystery. We've heard multiple different things come out of both organizations about trading back. Maybe the Cardinals will be willing to trade back at four, but they probably want Marvin Harrison jr. To give to Kyler Murray. So I really have no idea um, I, the one team I think will trade back is the Los Angeles chargers because they need a bunch of stuff. They need guys on relatively inexpensive contracts. And I think you know, there's going to have to be a good amount of roster turnover to be able to give Jim Harbaugh, the kind of team that he really wants to put on the field. So I think that's going to be the one spot where they're going to have to do it, but we'll find out. That's what makes the draft so fun. Uh-huh. Yeah. Cause it's unknown and. The cost, and like last year, you know, supposedly the Vikings were willing to trade up, but they didn't have a willing trade mm-hmm. partner, and you've got to take two to tango, just yes. like today, if uh, it's uh, it happens to be Valentine's Day. And if you have a Valentine that uh, you're treating, make sure that uh, you treat them right and show them that they are appreciated. Turn off the phone for a bit. We'll be here when you get back. Don't worry. Yeah. But mm-hmm. otherwise, yep. I, we're talking my wife quarterbacks, is, and we'll finish those out on Skull Search here within the next couple of weeks. Yes, we will. And my wife is almost home from work. Uh, we're going to make pizza tonight. We were going to do fondue, but she's not feeling the best. So we, we're pivoting to homemade pizza. I bought... Uh, Like uh, the deli at the grocery store in town will actually sell you like chopped up Italian sausage and pepperoni for pizza. So we're going to do sausage, pepperoni, and mushroom pizzas with uh, Parmesan and freshly, sorry, freshly grated Parmesan and mozzarella. So I'm really excited for that. It should be a really good one, but I'll say this much. These quarterback rankings may change between now and April's draft because I'll have more information. So these are not, completely set in stone, but I feel pretty comfortable with them right now, which is why we're having the conversation. And that is going to be our show. Thank you guys so much for listening. As Dave said, if you're watching on Facebook, one, thank you Two, go over to the YouTube, like subscribe, ring the bell because all the skull searches are there and you will not want to miss those. We've got ones already on Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix, Jr. Spencer uh, Rattler and Michael Pratt. And we also are going to have ones on, we just did one on Jane Daniels. We're going to have ones on Drake May and Caleb Williams as well. And we also have some on some defensive linemen. We have one on Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze. We're going to have a lot more coming your way. You will not want to miss any of them. Tomorrow there will be one. It may be live. It may not be. And we don't know the time yet because I have a business dinner that I have to attend to tomorrow night. So won't it, we won't be live at our normalish time. So you'll want to hit that ring the bell so you know when it's coming. And don't forget, two old bloggers, Sunday afternoon now, 4 p.m. That also opens up some potential extra skull search opportunities. You are going to want to ring the bell to make sure you know when we're going to have new content coming. In the meantime, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for staying longer than normal because we had a long and great show for you tonight. I'm Tyler. He's Dave. Skull Vikings, everybody. Skull Vikings. Like, subscribe, 
and ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community that we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis and myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone!